The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and um, wherever you are, different parts of the world, we're excited. This is really exciting. We're having a nice, great, terrific uh, webinar planned for you folks. You can see these smiling faces from different parts of the world up there, uh, California and the East Coast, and uh, we have our speakers, Michael Milligan from ABET and Cindy Cooper uh, from um, Lemon Cell Foundation. Okay, so uh, without wasting any time, I'm going to let take, hand this over to uh, to Michael to get the show on the road, and I'm going to step out. All right, Christian. Well, thanks very much, and thanks uh, very much to IPs for hosting uh, today's webinar. Um, I uh, hope everyone finds it um, uh, enjoyable, informative, uh, and um, it's, it's important material, so I'm, I'm happy to do this, and I want to first of all thank uh, Cindy Cooper from the Lemelson Foundation for joining me. I think you'll find her portion of our discussion very interesting. My plan is to uh, go ahead and do a little bit of introductory work. Uh, and that'll take about uh, 15 minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes, something along those lines. And then I will turn it over to Cindy and she can talk about Lemelson Foundation and their work. Uh, the topic for today is very important one. You can see making an impact on global STEM education. And uh, it's obviously uh, one that's uh, near and dear to my heart and all of us, uh, really, uh, because not only is it, um, uh, you know, our uh, sort of our obligation as educators to uh, to improve the quality uh, and the content uh, and the delivery of STEM education, but it's also critically important to all of us as citizens of our planet. So, uh, unfortunately, you've probably seen a lot of news, uh, certainly this past year, but even in previous years, and, you know, we face this great assault on our planet and, uh, you know, our climate, natural resources, our way of life is really uh, at risk, and all you have to do is look at the data. You know, we're we're STEM professionals. We like to see data and analyze data and deal with data. And the data doesn't lie. You can see uh, across all areas, kind of a spectrum of sort of disasters, if you will, uh, the increase that's uh, that we've experienced over these these past um, few years. Uh, most recently, this past September, so just what a month or so ago, um, it was the hottest September ever recorded. Okay, now certainly the records only go back so far, but I think it does illustrate some of the great challenges that we have and uh, climate above all, I'm sorry, that the warming of the climate above all, I think is probably the one area that we have to tackle most immediately because it affects all of the uh, ecosystems of our planet. And certainly um, we need to get this next generation of uh, engineering and STEM students, graduates, these, these great minds that are coming out of our programs focused on addressing these challenges. Uh, we've seen <clears throat> up close and personal, you know, some of the results of this. And I think the fires are probably a really good example. Uh, was in Australia um, uh, late last year, and and there were fires ongoing when I was there, and they continued on to the first of the year. And you can see the impact is pretty tremendous. Fires breaking out pretty much everywhere, uh, and the impact to to the ecosystems have been huge. You can see this over a billion animals perished. I mean, it's hard to imagine the, those kinds of numbers, but indeed a billion native animals perished as a result of these wildfires. And unfortunately, we see more of this, not just in Australia, of course, but around the world. Uh, you'll see uh, in South America, for example, in the Amazon, the deforestation that is um, that really took off last year, something over 70,000 fires, uh, and 10% of the species in the Amazon, again, um, have perished as a result, result of that. We've seen a lot of severe drought. You know, that's another um, prime indicator that the planet's not right. And uh, that's happening everywhere. Uh, in the U.S., for example, we've uh, experienced some severe drought over these past several years. And there's something on the order of 13 million acres of forest in the western part of the United States, primarily in California, but all over the western United States that have uh, burned just this past month. Uh, and even more, I mean, it's ongoing now, it's, the fires aren't out, they continue to, to burn. So this sticks accelerates these problems. And then of course, we know all about the plastic and the damage that the plastic is doing to all parts of our life. And so again, you know, trying to get this next generation of students focused uh, on addressing these problems is critically important to all of us and we all play a role in, in helping make that happen. Of course, COVID, that's the, that's the next challenge or the current challenge, I guess, but uh, you know, health uh, security for the entire planet is, is a big challenge. And again, 
the solutions uh, are going to come out primarily from the kind of students that are coming out of our programs, okay? Because these are the ones that are going to uh, develop the vaccines, think about how to how to distribute them, what's the most effective way to do it, so on and so forth. And I certainly hope there's a vaccine, but uh, every every day I pick up uh, the paper, I pick up my iPad, I guess, and I read um, lots of, um, you know, one day it'll be encouraging news, the other day it'll be sort of, you know, depressing news. So in any event, you know, these are again challenges that um, the students coming out of our programs will help uh, will help address. So at ABET, I wanted to talk a little bit about our role in, in all of this. Um, we've um, since I joined ABET back in 2009, we've always sort of had our uh, finger on the pulse, if you will, of uh, what are the contemporary issues, what's the, the biggest challenges facing our students, and so forth. And so we've spent a lot of time over the past several years focusing on different aspects of sustainability. And uh, in 2018, we dedicated our entire symposium to sustainability. So we brought in panelists from different parts of uh, industry, from academe, from the government, to talk about some of the challenges and what are the best ways forward to sort of uh, address the many challenges that we're facing. And uh, we're fortunate to have Dr. Daryl Pines. He's the now president at the University of Maryland, was at that time the dean of engineering. And I think, you know, he, he captured it pretty well when he talked about, you know, it's our obligation as uh, educators, right, to uh, help develop this next generation of students to make sure that they're prepared to address these, these challenges. Because, you know, um, in, this, in this day and age, uh, students fortunately want to be um, socially connected. They want to address these, uh, these challenges. And this is just a scene from, uh, I guess last year, one of the uh, protests in the, in the UK, but this, this appears all over the world. You know, this next generation of students really do want to uh, address these challenges, I think primarily because it's the right thing to do, but it's necessary to do, and it's their future that's at stake. And so we need to help them. Uh, the good news is they want to do this, and the good news is I don't think it takes a lot of um, effort on our part to convince them this is a, you know, the, the way forward, what we need to do is give them the tools, the knowledge, the skills, the experience, you know, in, uh, in our programs as undergraduates or graduate students to really give them all the tools necessary. So <clears throat> ABIT's had an opportunity to, to expand our impact uh, through education, quality of education around the world. Uh, you know, for many years we were uh, limited to the U.S., but now we've really grown beyond uh, traditional geographic borders, not just in terms of programs accredited, but overall the direction uh, and influence that we have on education. And if you look at kind of what we describe as our value proposition, uh, you know, we're all about providing confidence to, to students and to educators, to parents, to industry, and so forth. But really, it's all about producing these graduates for the next, um, in this next generation of graduates coming into the, the global workforce. Now, certainly we want to give them all the technical skills <clears throat> that they need, but we also need to give them a lot of other skills that will help them uh, be prepared to, to, you know, to really work in a way that they can help develop a more, as we say, as we say safer, efficient, and more comfortable, more sustainable world. And again, uh, we all play a part of that, and I think uh, ABED is in a perfect position to help influence this. So um, that's really uh, sort of my focus uh, in terms of um, external uh, communications and really helping uh, get influence programs. The good news, there's more good news, okay? So the, the rest of the good news uh, here is, you know, the education's responding. You'll see, just I grabbed a few quotes out of here, but, uh, you know, education's changing uh, for the better in terms of, again, focus on environmental and social sort of issues. And you can see in Australia, for example, I used the example earlier of the, the fires there, but you know, there's a pledge being taken by engineers that they are going to put sustainability first, sustainability first when they take on new projects. So that's critically important because, you know, students, uh, you know, in their senior design projects or as they get out and start uh, working in industry and so forth, they can come up with the very best technical solutions. But at the end, they may not be sustainable solutions or they may have an adverse impact on our natural resources or the disposal or whatnot of the, of the you know, sort of the goods and services that they're providing. So uh, putting sustainability first uh, is, is critically important and it's great to see that, uh, uh, you know, that um, public statement by these uh, engineers in Australia. Uh, again, education's changed. A lot more engineering courses now focused on climate action. Okay, this is the, you know, demand for engineering courses in sustainability in general has increased. And uh, there are new programs in new renewable energy. Uh, around the world. And so I just mentioned a few countries there, but tremendous growth in these areas. And uh, it's, it's really due to the demand of uh, 
for large part students. Students want to be uh, a part of the solution, as I mentioned. One of the uh, opportunities we have as educators is really to talk about the challenges, uh, you know, sort of the goals across the spectrum. And when I look at uh, this particular graphic, you know, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, an excellent um, opportunity to inject this type of discussion in everyday coursework, okay? You don't have to have a special course on sustainability necessarily. You don't have to have a special course that talks about, you know, these goals and our impact and so forth. As educators, I, I, it's pretty straightforward and, and relatively easy, I think, to weave in these, these themes into everyday uh, discussion with your students. All you have to do is pick up the paper uh, on any day or again, go back to your iPad and look at the news and you'll see topics across all of these areas, uh, uh, you know, news items that are being discussed. Uh, the good news and why I think ABED is in a fortunate position in a sense is that to me, uh, education, quality education is the common thread through uh, solving all of these uh, and addressing all these goals is you have to have a, a large, well-educated uh, workforce that has uh, you know, all the tools uh, and, and skills necessary to uh, to really address these. And so for that reason, um, again, I think, you know, ABA has a particular role to play and I'm, I'm quite, um, I'm happy to be part of that. One of the challenges that I hear a lot from students or others is they want to be the next big entrepreneur. And so we think about Facebook or we think about Amazon or whatever the, the court the case may be. But you know, the interesting thing here, Forbes magazine says the next big thing for entrepreneurs is sustainability. And so again, throwing this challenge out to students is a, is a great way to kind of get that conversation going. Because if you think about it, you know, think about that, that, uh, that engineer or that group of engineers that comes up with a really efficient way to dispose of plastic in a way that's not just sustainable but gives back in some way in terms of resources and so forth those people would be wildly successful financially uh, as well as their impact of course to, to, to cleaning up the planet so i think there are many 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 opportunities uh, for entrepreneurs in this area of sustainability and again here's a i think a really good sort of third party um endorsement of that whole idea so again when you're with your students you know we have the opportunity to help shape how they'll view their role in the world we have an opportunity to kind of shape their futures in a sense and so um, please take the opportunity to talk about these social environmental challenges that we all face their role and, and their obligation to help address them and then you know just sprinkle in great examples again sustainable development goals the united nations has the uh, the grand challenges I'm sorry, the uh, National Academy of Engineering has the, uh, the grand challenges they, they, they uh, have published, which in many cases overlap. But nonetheless, we have lots of examples to use. And again, um, you know, for those that really want to get out and, and make a difference, you know, encouraging entrepreneurship is a, is a great thing. And I think that's a great segue because uh, Cindy's going to pick up from there and talk a little bit about uh, the Lummelson Foundation and how they, uh, how they support this. Thank you so much, so Michael. It's oh, thank Cindy, you. Go ahead. I want to make you the presenter in just a second, Cindy. Yeah. Like we'll do this magic. So you click show my screen. There you go. I mean, you you can see your face, but now your slides have to come in. Click show my screen. Okay. There you go. Perfect. You see them? Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Can you still see them? Okay. So yeah, it's such a pleasure to be here. And thanks, Michael um, and Krishna and the whole team at ICs, Hans, Aliki. It's really fantastic to get to connect with all of you. It's interesting hearing Michael's presentation. You know, I'd, I'd seen it before, but to hear it come to life uh, and remember that when I really first learned about ABET was at that 2018 symposium focused on sustainability. And when I hear Michael's presentation, you know, just reminds me of the affinity that we have. Our organizations are really seeking similar purposes and we have different approaches, yet we're, we care about a lot of the same issues and the same um, sort of end results. So really fantastic to hear that. Thanks, Michael. So the Limelson Foundation, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that, just a bit about myself. Um, I'm not an engineer, but I think I have a lot in common with engineers. I, I'm an, I would consider myself an innovator. I, have been working in the space of social entrepreneurship and social innovation for over 20 years. And I have a real appreciation of innovating solutions and for continuous improvement, which I think are some of the things that I see in folks who are from engineering. 
I'm a program officer at the Lomelson Foundation, and I focus there on higher education programs. And I'm just very excited to tell you a little bit more about what we believe, what we do, who we are, and some opportunities to get involved in some resources that might be useful to you. So the Lomelson Foundation has been around for 25 years. We were founded by Jerry Limelson and his wife, Dorothy, who you see here. And Jerry was one of the most prolific inventors of the last century. He had over 600 patents on all different kinds of topics. He was an engineer. Uh, he had a bachelor's in aerospace engineering and he had two masters. One was in aerospace and one was in industrial engineering. And he and Dorothy really believed in the power of invention to improve lives. That's our mission at the Lemelson Foundation. Um, they believed that we needed to uh, solve important problems and that inventions also can fuel economic growth by creating high growth invention-based businesses. So how do we get these inventions and these invention-based businesses? Well, we need inventors. And so the, the Lemelson family, Jerry and Dolly, and the family still today, really believe in the opportunity to cultivate that next generation of inventors and to provide supportive education and entrepreneurship ecosystems to help them turn their ideas into products that have an impact. The foundation is based in Portland, Oregon, and we are a staff of 12, and it's still run today by, by the family, by the Lemelson family. So this slide really speaks to things that you heard also in Michael's presentation, this idea of invention is, is a way to improve lives. And the foundation is driven by these three tenets that we call impact inventing. So one tenet is that we're seeking to promote and educate students about impact inventing for positive social and environmental impact. Um, Michael mentioned some examples, vaccines, uh, Technologies to address climate change, prosthetic devices, there are all kinds of things that can have positive impact. We're sector agnostic, uh, but you know, we really are trying to support those inventions that can make a difference. We also see that it's really important for new inventions and new invention-based businesses to be environmentally responsible. And this means no matter what they're developing, you know, no matter what the business is developing, the inventor has created, that it would not be damaging to the environment. So, you know, whether it's a medical device or a widget, you know, really learning about things like life cycle assessment um, to minimize negative potential environmental impacts. And then the third tenet is that we believe in the power of business to take ideas into the world where they can be scaled. Um, you know, it's not invention just for the sake of a new idea, but to really turn that invention into something that has an impact. And we support those entrepreneurial pathways so that inventions can turn into commercialized products where they can have an impact. I think now we're coming up to the video, so I would love to have help for uh, playing this, because I think it won't work for my own computer. Copy. We'll give it a shot. Thank see that she has got it loaded up, so let's see. Give him a minute to uh, to do his magic. Yeah, something is happening. Let's see. Well, it's sending me a message. Are you okay, Sridhar? Is it going to happen or not? Either. Let me know what's going on, Sridhar. You have to make yourself the presenter. Shall I try it? 
try. I don't know. Try. Let me. I don't know what. What. Let me, I'm just going to. Let me try I'm playing gonna, it. Try playing it. I don't know why Sridhar is not. It's not uh, playing it. Can you hear it? Sorry, but. Can you hear the audio? Okay, no. Let me, let, okay. No, let, okay. Just you stop it. I'll try it. I don't know what happened to Sridhar. He's not. Uh, Okay, morning. we can also just move on. I'm it's no problem. Try, I'm going to try it myself. I'm going to make myself the presenter. Okay, and I'm going to show my screen and I'm going to share the recording. Lomelson Foundation and we work on improved lives through invention. We have found a number of exciting opportunities where environmental responsibility is being baked into the businesses. It's not so much the nurture product, it's the energy storage product. That's really the key innovation. People that work in our space are cognizant of the environmental ramifications. We're really big on being green. One example of where I think we've had huge impact on lots of individuals in the developing countries is in the area of access to renewable energies. Solar energy empowers people. The biggest motivator in Circle Foundation is the fact that the work we do can have a social impact. They are creating economic opportunity, they're doing it in a sustainable way, and exciting new products solving real problems for the future. Young people today are really savvy about the world and the environment, but they're not savvy in terms of how to actually address some of these issues. We need to up the game of spirit education, inventing and sustainability of the living elements, which is completely change K-12 education. The Lemelson Foundation works with VentureWell to provide students with grants and mentoring and education that helps these students conceptualize new products that solve social and environmental problems. Students can create things that change the world and that last and that are sustainable. Biology makes materials in a way that's very compatible with the environment. We try to understand the science of how that works and develop new technologies based on this idea of environmentally friendly engineering of materials that are important for the world. In the past, we may not have considered how the design impacts the people, how it impacts the planet. Sustainable design is where a designer is actually looking at the full life cycle from raw materials to production, distribution to end of life. We can design a whole new generation of materials that are more compatible with our society. We use the root structure of mushrooms to create sustainable resins for everything from packaging to building materials. You start with ag waste and you get what I think is a beautiful product. Environmental responsibility is going to be key for the winning businesses of the future. We want a sustainable world. We need it. Okay, that was good. We worked out fine. I'm going to make you back the presenter again, Cindy. Great, thanks Excuse so much. Me. Just click show much of your screen and that's it. Hey, well done. Some group problem solving. Appreciate it. Great, so as you saw from the video, you know, we're really hopeful and we really do see the impact that this kind of invention can have. And we also feel a sense of urgency. Um, you probably do too. You, you chose to come to this session for a reason. So the Lemelson Foundation would like really nothing more than for every future inventor and engineer to maximize their positive impact while also minimizing their negative impact. And we also really think that this is what will help companies be most successful. So a little bit more about us and where we work. Um, on this slide, you, you can see that illustrated. We work nationally across the United States, and we also currently work in a couple of low and middle income countries. Primarily, we work in India and then a few countries in Africa, East Africa. In the US, our work is focused on fostering the future inventors, as I've mentioned, through education and supporting their growth into entrepreneurs when appropriate. So we work in the U.S. across primary, secondary, post-secondary levels of education. It's really the core of our work. Outside of the U.S., 
in India and East Africa. Um, we're also seeking to develop that pathway of inventors and support for invention-based enterprises. We're less involved in education, um, but more involved in supporting the entrepreneurial ecosystem for invention-based enterprises that um, specifically are addressing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So now I'm going to shift a little bit to tell you a bit more about our work in higher education and share some resources, hoping that those might be useful and interesting to you. And this is Jerry again. Um, he conceptualized a program that became the foundation's first grantee. It's a program that would foster the next generation of collegiate inventors and help them bring their ideas to impact. That organization today is known as VentureWell. I mentioned it in the video, and we still work very closely together. And this is really a, a vehicle through which we generate um, impact in higher education nationally is our partnership with VentureWell. So they've been supporting student inventors and innovators for about 25 years. They um, have numerous programs. These two here on this slide are kind of the core programs that are about fostering invention and innovation in higher ed. And the E-Team program focuses on supporting promising student invention teams and um, provides them with training and grants. They can get money to help their ideas get off the ground. And then the faculty programs, they have a, a number of things that they do for faculty. And one is also a grant program where faculty can apply for grants up to $30,000 to create courses and programs that foster student inventors and innovators. And so this, this program really helps those future inventors to be inspired, to germinate, to grow, to thrive. It's kind of creates that fertile ground. And both of these programs have been really successful over the years, really some remarkable impact through both of these um, that you can see here on this slide, you know, where we're seeing these student teams take off and become viable businesses, raising millions of dollars um, outside of, you know, after the program. And then we see with faculty programs, for example, these courses that that we've um, indirectly supported through VentureWell, that VentureWell has supported, 80% of them, more than 80% are still offered today. So it's really creating changes in higher ed. This is a list of some of the resources I've mentioned, the faculty grants and some other resources that you can find on VentureWell's site. And on my screen, the website is cut off, but it's VentureWell.org. Um, the faculty grants that I mentioned, if you're in a U.S. higher education institution, you could apply. Somebody from your institution could apply. You become a member of VentureWell. They're actually waiving the membership fee this year. And there is an application due November 4th. So that could be a really interesting opportunity. Um, <laughs> so I thought I'd mention that. Specifically, but there are these other things as well that are open to folks, you know, around the world. The open conference, it'll be online. And again, for, for faculty, academic leaders interested in fostering innovation and entrepreneurship, March 17th through 19th, they just concluded a BME IDEA conference. And this is focusing on faculty from biomedical engineering. So if that's a group that you're interested in, they not only have a US. Uh, group, but also groups in Europe and Africa and Asia Pacific that are that are coming up. They recently created a report, did research to advance equity and inclusion among science and technology innovators and inventors, students, you know, this is student focused. So um, they have this great resource with some really actionable advice about things that you can do to make your entrepreneurship support programs more equitable and, and inclusive on campus. I uh, highly you know, recommend taking a look at that. I know this group is also very interested in issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then in terms of environmental responsibility, this is a theme that has come up now a couple of times. There are free resources on the website for educators, for innovators that talk about sustainable design, you know, how to do a life cycle assessment, assessment, how to do systems mapping. There's some wonderful videos that were originally developed by Autodesk that you can now find on VentureWell's site. So hopefully some of these things would be useful to you. So as you're hearing, the foundation is really focused on this power of invention, the power of engineers and scientists to create improvements in the world through invention and we recognize that the problems of today can uh, or the solutions of today can become the problems of tomorrow so we really need to try to avoid that and the good news is and, and michael spoke to this too is that we have a lot of knowledge on how to do that we just need to make sure that students are equipped with that knowledge so um 
in our work, you know, we actually have found that there is a bit of a capacity gap between the need for these sustainable solutions at scale and the educational preparation needed. Um, so as a result, we've launched an initiative called Engineering for One Planet. And this initiative, Engineering for One Planet, starts with the premise that while engineers have an outsized impact on nearly every aspect of our lives, engineering education isn't ubiquitously preparing them um, to operate effectively within our planet's constraints. Now, I think we want to get there, but it's really hard to get there. So how, you know, how can we ensure that all um, engineering professionals are equipped with the fundamental competency, skills, and knowledge in environmentally responsible engineering by transforming engineering education. And I would say, you know, by doing that as quickly as possible, there's, there's urgency. So again, a lot of us, and I'm sure, you know, us meaning folks on this call care about this, um, but it's really hard to do. So we've been trying to work with others, um, you know, with so much in common with AVET and others to, to try to advance this, this effort. Um, it's a popular idea, it's increasingly popular, and you know there are a lot of reasons why. And this will start to sound very similar to things that Michael talked about, and I'll go through this quickly, but there's, there's need from all sorts of different perspectives. And obviously the planetary constraints and the negative impacts that we're seeing around us, this has to change. We have one planet with finite resources. Uh, we know not a lot about how to avoid making things worse. And so we need to make sure that people who can have an impact on this are having a positive impact and are preventing um, negative consequences. So, um, you know, that's, that's what this is about. You know, we, we see that pollution, climate change, loss of species, uh, we're not operating within our constraints. So we need to, to shift that quickly. And business sees this too. So there's a business case and it's increasing um, for the importance of sustainability, you know, and, and the relationship between being more sustainable in business practices and how that actually is correlated positively with financial performance. And investors, institutional investors like BlackRock, which has six to seven trillion dollars under assets, they're demanding this too. They're, they're saying, you know, when we invest uh, our massive assets, we are putting sustainability as a priority. And then similar to what Michael talked about, the need from the perspective of the students and you know, the, the future generations, you know, we need to think about uh, you know, down the road, what is the legacy that we're leaving? But right now, immediately, you know, young people are demanding change. They're demanding change in their education. They're demanding change from their employers. We have about 2 billion millennials out there now who are in, working in the world. And, you know, we think of them maybe as young and, and maybe they're still in school, but the older millennials, maybe they're your bosses, right? Like the older millennials are in their late, late 30s. They're leading changes. So they're demanding, um, you know, they're holding us accountable to the need to create these changes as quickly as possible. And similarly, the next generation, Generation Z, they're growing up as climate crisis natives. So this is the world that they see. And as Michael said, this is about their lives, you know, really prioritizing these issues because their lives depend on it, you know, the, the thriving of their lives. And it's not just, oh, are you alive? But, you know, what kind of world are you living in? And what's, what's the quality of your life? And, and what's, what does it feel to thrive? And so they're certainly demanding that um, our educational paths and our um, working world uh, respond to these needs. So how do we create change in engineering education, acknowledging how difficult that is? It's a complex system. Uh, it takes time to create change. There are already a lot of stressors in the engineering education. We're asking a lot of faculty. We're asking a lot of students. Um, and it's hard. And you know, as we've been looking at this from the perspective of the Lemelson Foundation, we see so much interest. Uh, we've engaged with hundreds of stakeholders who create a, um, care about creating these changes, and we all know we can't do it alone. You know, none of us can. So, um, you know, these three objectives are kind of three short-term priorities for the foundation. They're interrelated strategic actions that we feel based on our own core competencies and resources that we're best equipped to try to tackle through engineering for one planet. So I'll speak to each of them a little bit. First, um, 
oh, just to quote him, if you want different results, do not do the same things, you know? So, yeah, you know, so we say it's really hard to create change, but in order to get different results, we're going to have to change. And um, so how do we change education? So one step that we have taken is, you know, as we were talking to people about this need to provide more skills um, across engineering disciplines, you know, not just to the students who choose environmental engineering or sustainable engineering, but to every engineering student. How do we do that? What is it that we think they need to learn? Well, we didn't have answers to those questions just sitting, you know, in our foundation alone. So we actually went out to the community. We invited stakeholders from academia, from business, from uh, other nonprofits, from other philanthropies, to talk about, you know, what is it that, that students would need to learn and to actually co-create a document. So last fall, we did that. Um, we had open commenting on a Google Doc, we had webinars, and people came in, and they really co-developed this content with us. And we've been sharing this in the past year as a draft framework for Engineering for One Planet. On the screen here, you see the summary. This is um, hard to see on the screen, but this is a, a one-page summary of the learning outcomes that this community said would be the most important. Um, in the center is the, some thinking, and you know this is central to everything else. So it's in the center, and the idea here is that it's systems thinking beyond you know a system of a design or a factory, but really systems thinking that widens those boundaries to consider the broader and environmental, uh, the broader environmental and social systems. I'm um, happy to share this framework with people who might be interested in it. You can go to our website and find it, go to Benchwell's website and find it, but the easiest way might be to just email me. So please don't hesitate to do that. I'll share my email address again in a little bit. Um, but yeah, there's this one pager, but there's also a full document that you can see the context and kind of all the thinking that's gone into it in more detail about these learning outcomes. So this was really just a necessary first step. You know, what are we talking about? What is it that students would need to learn? And then the second objective, support change in engineering education. This is where we're actually putting our grant funding, our resources into creating change. So with this framework, with these learning outcomes, we have worked now with, we've started to work with five higher education institutions as pilot grantees to take that framework and use it to guide curricular changes. So again, we have a what, but it's an untested what, and these institutions are going to use that framework and test it, and from that, we're also going to glean lessons about the how. We have content, how does it get taught? And they're going to share what they learn in terms of creating the curricular changes and in terms of teaching the content. And so that will be content or information that we, with them, share out to other educators, other institutions, to hopefully facilitate changes, to make it easier for others who want to pursue these kinds of changes. And then, you know, we would love to connect, and maybe some people on this call, you know, with other companies, funders, partners, um, to, to think about other ways to accelerate change in engineering education. There may be things that others can do that might use the framework or not, but there are a number of ways to support changes in engineering education, and depending on different organizations and their own core competencies and resources, they could pursue different activities, or there may be things that we can think about together. And so kind of similarly, um, building on that idea, our third objective is recognizing that different groups, different stakeholders have different ways of approaching these topics. Let's Let's learn from each other. Let's build and ignite a network for change. Let's collaborate. You know, through creating a network, not just working in isolation, we can elevate and create more urgency around this, this need for change. We can learn from each other, and maybe we can even, when appropriate, collaborate. Um, so, you know, like ABET, we're really looking at how do we get more more voices talking about this. It's It's been so fantastic to... Um, to join forces, you know, conceptually with ABET and talk about these issues together. I think that um, more of us doing this is, is only going to help. And next year, we'll actually be um, putting together a convening to bring people together for this purpose. So I hope that you are interested in what we're talking about. And, you know, if I can be a resource, I can send you materials. You see my email address here, cindyc at limelson.org. You know, please reach out. 
Um, you can add yourself to our newsletter um, to get updates. And I'm happy to, if you email me, to share with you a link for, for you to do that. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity to share a bit about what we're doing. And I um, and that is what I have for you today. And now Michael and I would love to hear what questions you might have for us. And if you if you don't have questions for us, we have questions for yeah. you. So yeah, we have lots of questions, lots of questions. <laughs> oh, you do. <laughs> We will, we will, we will. Like it's exciting stuff, and we really, uh, really enjoyed the, uh, the presentation. As Michael knows, you know, my it's, this is part of my passion to work on these kinds of things. I just moved back to India, and we have this uh, IUC Indo Universal Collaboration Engineering Education. And so, while I'm uh, waiting for questions from uh, the team, from the, uh, people out here, just my quick question from my side. Um, uh, you said you're something going on in India. You know, I, I moved to India now. I'm in India. So, what's your uh, what's going on in India with Lemonsa Foundation? Yeah, in India, we have been working with incubators, uh, largely with incubators and with other groups to support invention education, or not invention education, invention based entrepreneurship. So, I don't know if you've heard of Bilbro, Bilbro India. It's an incubator that supports startups that have you know invention and. Um, we have other activities that relate to providing funding support. I'm happy to follow up with you and connect you for more information from my colleague who oversees that work. Yeah, I mean, also in the engineering education space, Michael knows he worked with a whole bunch of colleges, and it's just the perfect kind of program that uh, any of them looking for. Yeah, we're not. We're not doing that much with, with education in India. We don't have direct programming, but we certainly have partners that collaborate on, with the incubators. Um, Stanford India Biodesign Program is one of the programs that we've collaborated with. Okay, let's see. I'm going to put Ala and a few other people on the spot here and see if they have some comments. Ala is here. Some of my good friends are here. Ala is here. Elsie is here. I got a few regulars over here who, uh, uh, who I think... Uh, Always have some good comments to make about uh, exciting presentations like this. Uh, uh, Heba Suleiman from Egypt is saying, uh, "Any work in Egypt? Because you don't have entrepreneurs in Egypt." Currently, we don't have any work in Egypt. Maybe in the future, <laughs> but not right now. Yeah, but that's okay, part of that. that's part of the that's part of this uh, the purpose of this this kind of a webinar, right? Is to get people engaged yeah, get people. Uh, across the globe. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. you have Cindy's email that, address, so start a conversation with her. Yeah, coming. Yeah, on I up. think that it's really it's it's really important to us to always be learning about what's evolving. So definitely. Yep, coming Allah. The kind well, of uh, thank thank you for a, for a great presentation and uh, just to follow up. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm very excited be, being the incoming president of, of IFEAST to, to uh, look at the prospects of, of working with, with the foundation on, uh, on several initiatives, uh, especially when it comes to accelerating uh, curricular changes. Um, as you know, we operate all around the world and uh, our colleague from Egypt uh, uh, was just asking, so maybe uh, something we can do is is to, to uh, expand the international reach of the foundation into Africa, into your, your India already, maybe maybe Latin America, uh, Africa, the Middle East, and and so on. One thing that I would like to say is that uh, many of the most creative and uh, fastest evolving uh, changes. Uh, whether it be to curricula or whether it comes to inventions, happen in, in, in areas where there is a need for such change. And so uh, looking forward to working with you. I'll, I'll be in touch via email. Great. That's Thanks, a fantastic Al. comment. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And actually, we do have resources that are under development that can be useful. We've been working with, with uh, educational partners, primarily in Malawi, and expanding into Tanzania on an effort to bring invention education to kind of transform some of the universities in Malawi and Tanzania. Uh, this is a partnership that we that is um, through also Rice University that um, for many years now we have learned some great lessons about creating curricular change, um, providing training to faculty, providing experiences for students, building design studios. 
So we're actually um, working with this team on developing a guidance document that could be useful for others in any geography, really, in terms of what are some ways to go about um, creating changes in the curricula or in the pedagogy that can be helpful in this context of invention education. Okay. Uh, any other comments from you? Yeah, but Elsie, I've unmuted you. Elsie, you want to come in? Speak for yourself. Elsie, you, you have a comment. I thought you'd let you speak for yourself, Elsie. Okay, her comment is, I'm going to read it out. Is she's not the where does impact inventing meet impact investing? Oh, here I am. Here I am, oh, Krishna. Can I can speak for yourself. <laughs> thank you so very much. And thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I was um, really attracted to the this term impact inventing because uh, we actively follow the impact investing sector. And um, as you talked about, Cindy, you know, the, um, the investment community is, is rather enamored now with the SDGs and with something called ESG, environmental, social, and governance. But most of it is around the risks associated with environmental, social, and governance issues. You, in, in using this term impact inventing, have are opening up a horizon of the opportunity in taking a whole systems approach um, from the business and investment point of view. I think it's brilliant. Um, uh, yeah, thank you for that comment. And um, it's one of the reasons I wanted to work at the Wimbledon Foundation. You know, this, this ethos and this pursuit of impact inventing is very inspiring. And yeah, those intersect. I mean, yeah, brilliantly stated, you know, where does impact inventing meet impact investing? We, we see that as part of our work. You know, we do, um, we do foster conversations and take part in conversations in that impact investing landscape, particularly in India, actually. And again, this is, you know, where I would love to have my colleagues weigh in who aren't on this call, um, who have more details on, on things that we've done. But, Supporting that uh, the knowledge building around that intersection and the opportunity where, like you said, it's not just about minimizing risk, although that is a huge opportunity and has really important financial and planetary implications. It's also about seeking the opportunity to make things have a societal impact and environmental impact to, to change things for the better for the world around us. And I think you know, inventors, a lot of times they're, they're attracted to this and engineers to that because they, they want to create positive impact and they have the skills to do it. So I think you're right. You know, those conversations are highly aligned and we, um, in our work in the U.S. and abroad are, are, um, fostering and seeking to connect, um, those, those conversations. Venturewell, for example, in their programs, they have an investment preparedness program. Um, you know, I talked about the student e-team program, so student teams applied, if they get selected, they get training, they get grants. Um, there's a third stage of that e-team program um, called Aspire, and it's all about investment training. So those companies that have, you know, gotten to the point where they really have something viable that could be investment ready are in this kind of a, a you know, intensive training that teaches them about becoming investment ready, the legal issues, they stress test their business. And in that they're they're connecting with impact investors. So they are the program brings in investors as mentors, as you know, as advisors, uh, but it also can lead to them potentially pitching their businesses to impact investors. So that's certainly a group that we want to continue to connect with and to bring to our partners so that they can have relationships with impact investors and bring them into these programs and create that pipeline. Okay. Yeah, comment. that's brilliant. Comment from Anil Kumar Pandit, who's uh, 40 years, 50 years worked with G for General Electric in, in India. He says they have been introducing a clause of environmental impact analysis in all international product standards like IEC to make it mandatory for new products and all products undergoing revision. So that's a good, good, 
good thing happening. Great. Thank you, Anil. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. And here's that's another amazing. one. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. Thanks what for is it finding called? Out. It's called Environmental Impact, uh, let's see, Analysis uh, in, as part of the international product standards that they've introduced. Okay. Maybe I'll, I'll have an If you have contacts there, I'll have <laughs> you know. Me. Yeah, send me an email and I can, oh, you can send the email directly to, to Cindy, Anil, okay? Okay, here's a comment from a, a question from a university in India, BML Munjal University, uh, Yerumaneni. So we are focused at our university, we're focusing on learning by doing, introducing 45% of our uh, whole curriculum towards learning by doing. Uh, looks like this is a good a good approach for introducing sustainability type of concepts. Any kind of advice you have from your side? Maybe Michael, maybe, or you, or Cindy? Michael. Education side? <laughs> well, you know, like I say, I think, you know, the important thing, you know, I'm, I feel strong, very strongly about leadership and providing opportunities for allowing the faculty and so forth to kind of lead, lead you know, you learn by doing, obviously, critically important that's how everybody you know that's, that's the most effective way but um, one of the challenges I, I, I get a lot is you know faculty say hey I don't have time in my course to cover this or I don't have my time in my course to cover that and you know in, in effect you don't need the time you just need to make sure you're consciously weaving in these topics because they're everywhere and it doesn't you know it doesn't take a lot to uh, you know it's a lot of extra work to do it but you know the leadership of the institutions they just have to you know kind of Press the faculty to keep these, you know, kind of make it a priority to keep these things in mind because otherwise, you know, because students want to learn, they want to, they want to learn this stuff as we've talked about this this past hour. I mean, students are are interested, they're engaged, they want to be engaged. So you're giving them more of what they want, and it'll be much more effective if it comes directly from you know, from the faculty in everyday sort of environment. Okay, uh, Hans would like to make a few comments. Before that, I just want to explore, and I'll probably follow this up with both you and Cindy and Michael. Have, has anybody taken the approach that, okay, here we've got, uh, you know, Lemelson has put in funding and raised the, raised the money to do these kinds of things. Uh, so let, let's say the concept can be used to raise funding in other countries by potential funders in those countries, right? And that's something, has anybody done that? Say, okay, here's a here's something that's happening, fundraising is happening, is being provided. A similar approach, let's say in India, if, if we found a bunch of wealthy people, so, you know, we don't have to come up with a new idea ourselves. Here's a model that we can follow. All we have to do is raise the money and do the kinds of things that Lemelson is doing. Is that is that is that copycat approach happening anywhere with uh, anywhere in the world? Yeah, that's that's great. Um, there is yes, <laughs> yes, and there's yes. something that we we actively we actually actively seek to do that. You know, to share with other funders. Here are the things that we're learning. And you know maybe these are things you're interested in. And in India, we were early investors in the Masala Bond. So I don't know if you've, you've heard of that, but that was again um, a tool to create a new way to invest in early stage invention-based businesses. And I think you know we provided catalytic funding to kind of prove the utility of that instrument, and that allowed others to see, okay, this is something. You know, so we kind of de-risked it. And um, you know, to be able to then share that story, and that's something that we've done intentionally. Our my colleagues have gone out and talked to others about, and at conferences, or you know, actually reaching out one on one to share what we learned through that, and invite others to use those models. So yeah, I think it's a, a brilliant comment, and um, something that we're always looking to do, and is a really important way to leverage, you know, the, those catalytic funds that we put in, the learning that we do, and then hopefully inspire others. To follow suit. And I like the two questions that you put up. That's like a quiz for everybody in the room today. How might engineering for one planet be relevant to you and your work? That's a good thing. So let's have everybody. Come on, everybody, put your pen to the chat box and tell us what you think about how engineering and planet might be relevant to you. From your perspective, is it a priority to prepare engineers? The innovation and environment sustainability are they gaining these responsibilities, the abilities and knowledge during school? Should they be? Great. Wonderful questions, and I'm sure that they've got everybody thinking. Uh, Hans, you want to come in? I got, I got to unmute you, maybe. I don't know if you. Yeah. There you go, Hans, come in. Yes, thank you very much, Krishna. Cindy, 
I now fully understand the passion of why my dear friend and colleague Michael introduced me to you to see the coincidence of the vision and passion that both ABET and that he articulated and what you articulated is absolutely 100% relevant to the issues of our global community. I'm really happy that you, for the first time, have given this presentation to our IFES community, our GDC community per se, and uh, I'm certainly want to follow up. Uh, one issue, um, several issues, expanding your network. Absolutely. I mean, I know you have a deep commitment with Malawi. We have some common friends. Tanzania, you've mentioned. I'm working with the newly formed GDC African Dean's Council that are working on some concrete issues. And I'm going to introduce you to some of the leaders there with whom I'm working on a daily basis on some of the critical current entrepreneurial issues that impact African society. I could talk for a long time. I've noticed Latin America on your map. I don't know which countries per se. Again, we have a very dynamic network, as Michael was saying, that is part, part of our global community that you're now part of. And final comments is, I'm really happy that you and Michael Abed is working together and with us now in our global virtual conference in November. Very exciting, I'm working daily with good friends you're gonna get to know, they're gonna get to know you per se, uh, coming up and a key variable, consistent what you're saying, is the strongest student engagement I have ever seen. We have five student organizations globally that are engaged in a way and the issues you are articulating are 101% relevant. Just a final thing, this is the first time and I've been insisting on this, we are doing this now for the November conference. We are also, given the crisis that we as leaders, as students, as faculty and, and so forth have, we are also talking about mental health issues. Engineers don't want to talk about those kinds of issues and our students primarily have pushed us to talk about it and that's an inter integral part for the first time in our global work that we've done together with Krishna, with Michael and, 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 and Allah who is, is with us per se. Very important new dimension. So on behalf of IFES and the GDC community, Cindy, awesome. We look forward to, to continue and deepen our friendship and experience and, and partnership and explore more ideas. Thanks, Michael, again, for facilitating this very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy, can you put up the slide with your email ID on it? I think some people are, who are looking for that again. Thank you, I will. Hans, thank you so much. Thanks for this opportunity. And like you said, it's, it's been really fantastic to find so many friendly, like-minded folks. And just an honor to be here and get to know everybody. You're an amazing connector, Hans, and I appreciate your passion for that and um, again the invitation to be a part of this conversation in this group so it's can you all see that slide now ndc at lemelson.org right that's what it is that might yeah that one's kind of small i'll do this other one bigger your last slide of the had, had it bigger there you, there go. you go yeah great okay on that note just memorize that and email her guys <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And we'll have another opportunity to engage with Cindy and I at the at during week. So yes, keep that in yes. mind. Take care, everybody. Right. Thank you so much. We'll everybody. see you next month. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Peace be with you. Stay healthy, everybody. Stay bye, healthy. bye. Stay, stay, stay happy. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. 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 Thank you.